we've got this great fellow. His name is Philip Dockery. And what I always tell people is that he's smarter than me. He's nicer than me. And he's got this incredible, humble way about him. Um, you know, you've probably watched some of his videos and he makes lots of these videos on our channel and they're about things that he's learned as a fellow. And inevitably when you're learning, you know, there are things that you figure out that you could have done or should have done. And I mean, those are great, but I think it's also important for me, you know, what, what's really remarkable for me is how what a great surgeon he is, how many amazing operations that he performs. And I want to show you one of these great operations that he did in our office just a week ago. This is a DMEC in a complicated situation. And I want to show you some of the things that he would be too humble to point out that made his operation truly great. And Philip has been with us now for three and a half months, or maybe going on four months now. And he's done, I think at this point, 60 unassisted DMEC operations. That is to say 60 DMECs in which I have not been in the room, that I haven't helped him at all. And then God knows how many other cases in which we've done together, in which he's been the primary surgeon and I've helped. But I mean, he's really racked up such an incredible list of accomplishments already. And let me show you one of them. So this is a patient that he is operating on, Philip is operating on a week ago in our office, okay? And he's making his paracentesis the same way that I do. He's using this 15 degree blade. And a subtlety that I wanna point out is notice how he's holding the knife. The knife is being held such that the incision is made bevel up. And that's important because it's the most controlled way to make these incisions. That way, if the patient jerks their head or if they roll their eye up in the head, it's the blunt part of the knife that would withstand that force. So the eye wouldn't be lacerated by the knife. And having made those paracentesis nasally and temporarily, now he puts a little bit of lidocaine in the anterior chamber and you'll see the eye squeezing a little bit because the patient can feel that anesthesia percolating into the anterior chamber. And now he's delicately holding the eye with his finger while he makes a main wound with this 2.75 millimeter keratome directly temporally. And notice that he's also enlarging the wound a little bit. And the style in which that wound is enlarged is he makes the incision and then withdraws and then cuts up forward. So that's a better way of enlarging a wound than dragging down with the knife. If you cut moving the keratome forward, the shelf, the architecture of the wound is much nicer. And that's a subtle point. I and mean, that's a really classy, elegant way to make that incision. So here has got the anterior chamber maintainer connected to a 60cc syringe, which is being held by his assistant, and that is maintaining the space of the anterior chamber with air. And here we're using, or Phil is using this, this uh, inverted Sinsky hook, and notice the placement. It's far peripheral, but not out into the angle. I mean, this is a very tight, controlled way of making a far extensive decimetorexis and he loops underneath the anterior chamber maintainer and comes around and brings it to the side. And that's not easy to do. It's not easy to get underneath the AC maintainer with the inverted Sinsky hook. Now he's helped in that by the fact that the inverted Sinsky hook that we use is longer than a normal inverted Sinsky hook. Most of them have these little nubbly tips, but when you have a longer tip, you can get underneath the AC maintainer. And look how he strips. Rather than reaching out far peripheral and pulling in, the way that he's stripping initially is he goes to the side and he sweeps into the center of the eye. That's something that Garrett Mellis really emphasized when he was teaching DMEC. Rather than pulling towards you, you should strip in with a sweeping motion like that, which maintains the volume of the AC so much better, okay? So here, the 60cc syringe is out of air, so the assistant refills it and fills just holds inside the eye. He's just waiting for that to be refilled before it's time to strip again. And now he's stripping underneath the AC maintainer and he's just watching. He's watching to see that that sheet 
passes underneath the AC maintainer without getting caught up and torn. And that's also a really difficult thing to do, to extract that decimase membrane as a single untorn sheet from underneath the AC maintainer. And this is all very standard. It's routine. It's just the same way that I would do it. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit until we get to the next really excellent thing that Phil is doing. And that is having stripped most of the decimase membrane with his right hand, now he's stripping with his left hand. For you cornea specialists out there, how many of you, when you were a fellow, were doing a decimatorexis with your non-dominant hand? And that's what Phil is doing here, not just for fanciness points or to show off, but because your vantage point is so much better to access different parts of the eye if you use both hands. So having stripped the bulk of Decimase membrane with his dominant hand, he's clearing up especially underneath that paracentesis where he was on the right side, he's using his left hand. And Decimatorexis, I mean, it's a delicate, difficult, careful thing to do even when you're experienced using your dominant hand. But during your fellowship with your non-dominant hand to do any of it, much less the portion of Decimase membrane right next to the main wound, which is what he's tackling now. Those are the shreds that are usually stuck to the back of the cornea most tenaciously, which require the most delicate effort to remove. That's what he's removing now with his left hand. And then now he removes the bulk of this Decimase membrane from the main wound. The iris comes out a little bit, which can happen sometimes. It's no problem. Just reposit back in the anterior chamber and that's it. Okay. So the next thing Phil is going to do is he's going to clean up the edges of this Decimatorexis with this Mellis scraper. And again, this is very delicate, careful maneuvering, which he executes exactly the same way that I would do with the same exact technique and uh, in the same fashion. So having done that, Phil is now going to make his Paris, or excuse me, he's going to make his peripheral iridotomy using the Ertley capsulotomy handpiece. Notice how far peripheral he is. And he's not just waving the instrument around randomly. He's seating it down far peripherally at six o'clock. He's holding it there. And as these bubbles percolate forward, that indicates that he's cutting through and has cut through the iris. And having made that very far peripheral iridotomy, he's ready to move on. So now he's going to aspirate these little bubbles from the anterior chamber and he's checking to see if the chamber is deep and deepenable. And as he injected fluid, what he notices is that some of the wounds are leaking and the chamber, when you inject BSS, it deepens and then shallows again. And what that tells Phil is that he must be leaking from the paracentesis, so he's hydrating them. And that is something that's important to do before unfolding a graft because you don't want an unstable anterior chamber. You want a chamber where if you inject fluid, it stays deep. It doesn't deepen and then shallow and you're not leaking fluid during the unfolding because then you don't have control over the situation, the environment. So what he's testing now is does the anterior chamber do what I think it's going to do? Do I have control over it? And if not, I need to hydrate the wounds so it's a static condition. All right, so here's the complicated part. Here's where Phil really is going to shine. So he's injecting this graft into the anterior chamber, pointing it away from the pupil. You know, when you're doing these eyes and you do a block before the case, often you'll get pupillary dilation. So it's easy to look down and you're unfolding the graft and the pupil is dilated. And that makes the case much harder. And especially it's a problem if you're injecting the graft and the pupil is dilated, you can shoot the graft through the pupil. So it's a subtle, important point when injecting the graft to aim the injector away from the pupil into the angle so you don't shoot the graft down through the iris aperture. Here's the graft injected into the anterior chamber. And what should be immediately obvious looking at this eye is that this is a tightly curled roll, okay? This is a 
thin cigar of tissue and it's not going to be easy to open. This is going to resist attempts to open the eye. This is a young donor. This is a donor that's 50 years old, okay? And you can set yourself up for an easier case by using older tissue, okay? Sometimes we specify we want a donor that's 70 years old or older if we're working in some miserable nightmare anterior chamber. But in general, my attitude is it's good to work with tight roles in young donors often because it's a skill set you have to develop. You've got to learn how to open a tightly scrolled graft. And here's Phil on his own opening this tightly scrolled single roll. And by the way, this is a large graft. This is an 8.75 millimeter donor tissue. So it's a large graft in a tightly scrolled configuration. So let me show you the way that Philip unfolds this graft. The first thing he's doing is he's evaluating how this graft is sitting in the eye. It's a single roll that's interacting with the angle. So his initial approach is to try what's called the up bump technique. And that's where you tap the graft up into the angle. And you tap the graft up into the angle to try to get it to hit the angle and bounce back and break open. Okay, that's called the up bump technique and it's useful for opening up single rolls. Okay, so Phil has just tried the up bump technique and the graph didn't respond to that. So rather than prevaricating, rather than continuing to try that maneuver over and over again, Phil observes, oh, that didn't work. Okay, so try to, time to try something different. So now what he's doing is he's moved over to use a paracentesis that's perpendicular to the lie of the graft, okay? And he's squirting fluid at the graft, perpendicular to the graft, and the idea is to depress the wound and squirt fluid, not to shove the graft away from you, but rather to tumble the graft, okay? To grit, get the graft to flip around and over on itself, because that can often fling one of the edges of the graft open and break open one of these tightly curled rolls. So that's what he's doing. He's squirting to get the graft to flip and tumble like this. And you'll notice one edge of the graft does indeed flap over, okay? So having done that, we still have a single roll, but you can immediately tell this roll is less tightly curled. Now it's still a problem. It's still a single roll. It's still a tight graft but he's achieved something so far, okay? He's broken it open a little bit. So now Phil is observing, well, he's still got work to do. What's the next thing? He's doing a few more little up bumps, but really what he's doing here is he's massaging the graft over such that it's accessible from the main wound. And that's a point that I want to keep emphasizing to you, is Phil is not doing the same thing over and over and over again and hoping that it works. It's you try something, and if it doesn't work, you proceed methodically and thoughtfully and intentionally to the next thing. And the next thing Phil is going to do is he's moved the graft over such that the lumen of the tissue is accessible from the main wound, okay? That was not an accident. He did that on purpose. And now he's cannulating the graft through the main wound. And this is, again, why it's a bad idea. And you shouldn't suture the main wound. It's because you need the main wound. You need to be able to access the main wound in order to manipulate the graft. So he's trying to insinuate the cannula in there and then injects fluid and look, the graft breaks open. So now, by injecting fluid down through the lumen of the graft, he split it open. And the roll is, as you can tell, further loosened by those maneuvers. And now as Phil is trying the same trick as before, he's squirting fluid perpendicular to the lie of the graft. And you can see this is further flipping the graft over and breaking it apart. I mean, this is a very thoughtful, methodical way to pry this graft open from the inside. And now he's converted it to a double roll. And Phil knows that this is a winning configuration. So the other thing that Phil has done is you've just seen having recognized the double roll, the very next thing he thought is this is winning, okay? This is an operation that's done now. So I'm shallowing the chamber. He just shallowed the chamber through the main wound and he's placing taps in between those two rolls. And those couple of taps didn't start prying the graft open. Phil recognizes that immediately and says the chamber is still too deep, so he shallows the chamber again through the main wound. How many of you, when you were a fellow, had the guts to shallow the chamber repeatedly through the main wound? 
Having done that, now you see when he puts taps in between the two rolls, the graft opens and stays open, okay? So this is sort of a single rolled edge. He's got an open flap and he's got a tight roll on one side, okay? But Phil recognizes he can solve this. This is a puzzle he understands, and now he's gonna apply Dirizamer swipes. He holds down with, the, with one cannula and swipes over with the other. And he notices he doesn't have room, so he's applying shuffling bumps to move the graft over to one side. So he pins the graft down with one hand, he does Dirizamer swipes with the other, and when he runs out of real estate, he shuffle bumps the graft over in position. And now we have the graft totally unfolded, but he's not finished. He's centering it up in the eye, and having centered the graft, you can see the orientation notch, which is over there, that triangular lucency nasally. The graft is totally unfolded. It's centered with a slight superior bias. That's another very classy, nice, elegant, subtle point, is that the graft is largely 95% centered, slightly superiorly decentered because you get more protection. If the graft is lifted up higher, the air bubble supports the graft for longer. So now we have the interchamber filled with air. There is a 2% meniscus, okay? And that's great because you've got this big, far inferior iridotomy that this bubble is not going to occlude. And this provides wonderful support for the tissue, which is biased up a little bit superiorly. So I wanted to show you this video because I watched this video after the fact, okay? This was a patient that was operated on a week ago. And oh, by the way, here's the patient's OCT, which we obtained this morning. So the patient's vision today, a week after, six days after surgery, he is 2040, uncorrected. The graft is perfectly attached. The cornea is crystal clear. So by all means, a complete and resounding success, okay? And Phil would never tell you that. He wants to make videos about his mistake, which are great, you know? I mean, it's a learning point, it's fantastic. But um, he's, he's just the most amazing fellow. He's a smart, incredible guy. And this video is not just to brag about Philip. I mean, he's obviously wonderful, but it's because there are important things that he did that I want people to know about. It's how to deal with the tight roll. It's the specific mechanism for how to break open the tight roll, not by randomly tapping the eye. If you're randomly tapping the eye, you're doing something wrong. It's a thoughtful, careful, methodical process through various unfolding techniques until you hit pay dirt. And I thought that was so important to share. Thank you so much for listening to me talk about what a great surgeon he is and how what a true pleasure it's been to work with him to take care of patients. If you're interested, by the way, in doing a fellowship with us, reach out to us. If you wanna do an observership, call me. If you want to send videos into the channel to have us review them, we'd love to. Please help us help you to make the channel better. Thank you so much for watching.